Hello everyone, welcome to The Nines presented by at and I'm DDK, your host, and today joining me will be Mel, Katsumi, and Moon Chopper. And today's episode will be covering a variety of topics, uh, coaching, as we have Moon Chopper here, uh, the Game Changers 3 victory recently over the weekend by Cloud9 White, uh, you know, topical news, you know, LCQ and Cloud9 White in general. So lots of stuff to talk about. And uh, let's uh, let's start talking to our guests, uh, Ka uh, Katsumi and Mel. I mean, I've had you guys on a bunch of times, so you know this is old hat at this point for you. But Moon Chopper, what's up? It's, uh, it's the first time on the show. Welcome. Hi, nice to finally talk to you and be on the show. It's been a pleasure. Um, I've watched a couple of episodes back in the day, uh, and I've been meaning to get on the show for quite a bit. And this is probably the best time to do it, um, seeing that we just came out of a huge dub. Yes, yeah. Congratulations to to all of you for an amazing performance over the weekend. I was obviously I was casting it with Sean, and uh, it was it was a really fun series to cast. And given the usual history in the Game Changers Grand Finals, where you normally it's like very dominant, um, it's uh, it was really cool to see you know Shopify Rebellion you know putting up an amazing fight and uh, putting you guys to your paces a little bit. Um, so let's let's talk about that just off off the rip just a little bit. Uh, you know, Mel and Kasumi, how was that for you? Uh, definitely awesome. Great experience to, um, like for me, it just meant a lot knowing that we are on top for like a whole year. Like that was kind of like the milestone that we were going for is that like 365 days of just dominance pretty much. And obviously we did drop a map, but regardless, just winning out the series and securing that year of oh, hey, being on top feels really good. Yeah, definitely. The whole tournament up until those finals was like kind of a breeze, I won't lie, but the finals was actually a really fun and really entertaining series. It was nice to end on that note, and I'm really proud of the team. So, Yeah, it, it looked like, I, I mean, I know in the in the post-match interview over the weekend, uh, you were describing how it was kind of a breeze to get to that point, but I mean, it was, it was such an entertaining matchup. It was uh, really back and forth, uh, both you and Shopify Rebellion like showed so much resilience to kind of just, you know, if things kept going wrong for both sides, but you know, it's that problem solving and just kind of on the fly decision making is really enjoyable to watch in this game. And, uh, uh, you know, speaking of which, you know, um, Nuki, I, I want to say Nuki, I almost prepared to show with Nuki for example, for some reason. And so it's in my show notes, but Moon Chopper, you're not Nuki, you are Moon Chopper. Um, and you're the, the coach that, I mean, you focus on strategy for the team for cloud nine whites. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit more about your kind of role behind the scenes? Because again, we don't see the coaches too much um, or, or hear the voices of the coaches too much. So I'd love to kind of get more of an idea as to sort of the impacts that you're looking to have with Cloud9 White and like going into a grand finals like that, you know, the kind of you know preparation you know, you're looking at and you're focusing on um, to help prepare the team for success. So previously, uh, I was working with a team. We would work on using anti-strat. So I would formulate like um, anti strats and just be like, hey, if you see like this smoke at ascent door, then you'll most likely see a recon dart at this location. If they're doing that, then they're doing this default. I tried applying that with this team at the beginning, but it was just too much like info. So what we had to start doing was we would start giving out like really raw tendencies. And what helped us a lot going into the Shopify tournament was actually watching back together instead of just like Dream or I watching it back, uh, one of the maps to, for each of us and then writing our notes and then giving that information later. So that took a little time because at first when we tried doing it, it just did not work. Some people would be like, oh, they do this and other people's like reaction would be different. So it'd be like, there'd be like this kind of contention be between two people on a site. They'd be like, oh, oh, since they're doing this, we should play this way. But then someone else is like, it, without saying it, they'll play a different way and they'll just end up just being a huge mess. So, but all in all, Dream and I do a lot of similar stuff together. Um, for this tournament, we didn't go into so much for like strategy, like gimmick, gimmick rounds or like gimmick strats with ultimates or like pistols necessarily. We went into this tournament uh, majorly focusing on individual micro stuff. Gotcha. I mean, it's... There's a lot of, and there's a lot of that in this game. And um, yeah. so, I mean, I want to get into more depth there. There's there already, there's some, some pieces there that I want to kind of highlight that it makes a lot of sense in looking at Cloud9 White as a team, some of the things that you're saying, just the, the, the attention to detail. Um, and, you know, I want to nerd out about that, but I really want to give uh, everybody the opportunities also to, to get to know you a little bit more, uh, Moon Chopper, before we go forward. Because again, we don't get coaches on air enough. So I want to, to make sure we do a good job here. Uh, you know, how did you get involved in Cloud9 White? And can you tell us a little bit more about your background, first of all? 
Um, my background, I guess like from the very beginning, I've always been playing FPSs growing up. Uh, I've always had a knack for them. Uh, I was like competing at local lands in the Washington DC area where I actually met Shazam and his pub team for the first time. And this is when I was like a global elite in CS playing on a laptop. So I brought my laptop to like a bring your own computer like LAN and got absolutely stomped by Shazam's team. Um, and then from there, it became like Overwatch to Paladins. I played professionally in both, like semi-pro and Overwatch, professional in Paladins. And from there, like, I just went into Valorant coaching, like just as a, I don't know, it, I didn't go into it thinking I was like, oh, I'm going to do this like professionally. I was actually looking to go back to school during that time. Um, I was coaching uh, my friend's team who eventually picked up Shot Up, uh, who is now on Immortals. And from there, Shot Up brought me over to NSIC with Oderis. Uh, and that's where it all began, honestly. Um, everyone on that team was like, oh, this guy knows what he's saying, whatever. And from there, I just applied. Like, I just got reached out from there. So, and I'm like really proud of my old teammates back on Morning Light. They're all on, they're all signed. Like, Oderis, well, <clears throat> um, Shot Up is signed now. Neptune is signed on Rise. Like everyone is doing great, and I keep talking to them and see what's up all the time. And it's glad to see that they're thriving now too. I actually remember um, casting Neptune, and Neptune was like a sixteen. I, was, I mean, I was looking at that cast to see us go uh, tournament. I was like, hmm, he's sixteen years old, and he's he's playing really smart. I like, don't expect this from from a sixteen year old or playing with wisdom beyond his years. So, yeah, really. I mean, all those names that you dropped are obviously uh, incredible talents. So, uh, really cool to see everyone's doing well. Um, and you know, Mel and Katsumi, what's it been like? You know, working with Moon Chopper in terms of your relationship as players to to the coach to kind of implementing things. You know, the workflow. How how is that relationship for for each of you as as individuals and as a team? I honestly really, really appreciate having the coaching staff that we do. Um, I think they're amazing. Um, yeah, and I guess there's there's just a lot of like opportunity, like having two coaches and having like them like work on different things. There's a lot of opportunity to like focus on like individual things. Like if I'm like like oh I want to like really focus on this one thing. I want to watch back this one vod. Like there's always something like and like I've watched a ton of vods with like Moon and Dream individually. But there's always just someone available to really help me out. Um, and yeah, honestly, the coaches do a great job on literally everything they do. So, yeah, yeah plus I mean, one to everything oh, that she just said. <laughs> Sorry, uh, just major plus one with Moon. You can really tell the um, experience he has working with top players in Valorant. Like the the advice and the feedback that he gives you is extremely relevant to the situation. It's never like, oh, I don't know if the coach is right about this. Like I'm a, you know how some people are like, oh, I'm the player, you're the coach. Like I know how to play the game. I've never experienced that with Moon or dream for that matter yeah, yeah, but fine. it's just something that is like i feel like i can really appreciate because i know not every player can say that i can yeah. for the most part like moon is always on top of his feedback and his criticism and i've never really had a problem with anything he said and it's all very relevant it's awesome i mean again you know i think i think we kind of developing the convo around sort of uh coaching in a, in a general sense um in a moment because i think it is it's one of those unknowns in esports in general. There's no real standard that exists like team to team. It's kind of on the, the team to kind of just figure out however they want to do it. And I think for some teams, it works quite well. And for other teams, uh, they're, you know, they're missing pieces. And for, for others, it's a complete disaster. So from what I can tell, though, you know, from the outside looking in uh, with Cloud9, it, it has been like you have like great support around the players. And everyone I've spoken to has been happy, which is usually a good a good sign um, that there's no like resentment building up or anything like that. But uh, with that said, you know, uh, Moon Chopper, you're talking sort of about your role, you know, in helping anti-strat and kind of looking at the, the kind of finding out what the tells are uh, in the game for the team. But in terms of like, you know, not direct match preparation, but maybe, you know, trying to improve the team overall, what does that process look like typically? Because I guess that's the gear that you're going in, you know, let's say right, right now, I would presume just come off of a tournament. So there's no immediate prep happening. Uh, for another tournament, but you're looking to improve the team. So what is, how do you approach that as, as a strategic coach? So we've gone through different processes before. So like, we'll go through, like, at one point, we were always like VOD reviewing and then talking about like, which rounds went bad. Hey, we should do this. These are the takeaways, yada, yada. And then that became kind of stale. Like there is a moment where you keep doing something over and over again. And the takeaway you get is not good enough. 
um, that kind of happened with like us VOD reviewing as a team for so much. So we started going and we uh, at that point, we've understood a lot about the macro fundamentals about how we should slide together as a team, where we should push and pull, where we should take space when they're not there. Like, when should we take advantages? When do we need to force something? Um, so after doing that for so long and uh upping everyone's macro understanding we went into everyone's micro looking into people's like pov perspectives and being like hey the way you're swinging this is like really bad because you're opening up yourself to these angles or like hey your utility usage can be better here so we did a lot of that and that felt really good for us i think it really upped everyone's individual performance especially so we went into this tournament thinking Every single individual on our team can 1v3 these people because we are doing that to teams in tier two that are like just way more high profile or just more mechanically just like stronger and scarier, right? Um, another big thing that we do is we set up goals. We were on and off about setting goals up, but now we finally got like a document set up and we have these goals where everyone's talking about like, um, individually, like, hey, I want to work on this. I feel like I've improved on this today. I still want to work on this. Uh, on this map, I want to work on my calling here. Or on this map, I feel, I don't know, some type of way. And we'll go through that and we'll make sure at the end of the week, we'll like figure out like, hey, did we reach our goals? What do we need to keep working on? Yada, yada. I think one of the biggest things was like, uh, for me personally, when I worked with Lexi, who's not on the show, um, was her calling on bind. And I think Mel can talk about this more too, where I talked to Lexi about how her communication should be on our bind on CT and how she plays a big role on it. And ever since then, our bind has felt a lot cleaner on CT side, so. Awesome. I mean, it's, I mean, it really shows, I have to say like in watching the team, and this is something that, you know, Sean talks about as well, uh, Sean Gares, when we were casting your games and just observing the, the team dynamics, you know, one of the cool things about about your team is that, especially, you know, let's say in, in the female scene where you are the true leaders of that kind of culture, you know, you're, you're, you're leading with this professionalism, like a methodical approach, like a, a really good team dynamic. And you're focusing on the tactical and strategic, like you're not really leaving anything out. It like feels like you're, you're doing all of the work and trying to find all of the edges, which is like such a great, I think, precedent to set for everybody to try to have to follow to keep up with that. It's like so good. For the scene so it's always really good to watch that and uh you know just to kind of uh piggyback slightly off of uh, some of the points that uh, you're making there moon chopper i want to ask uh both mel and katsumi i'll, I'll start with you mel like you know in looking at some of these optimizations have has a is there anything that stands out to you where you kind of were caught doing something very wrong but through this process that moon chopper is sort of highlighting in working with the coaches you're like ah, oh, i'm playing this position suboptimally are there any actual like examples for you individually that stand out that you fixed uh, that you remember, and the same question to you, Kat Simi, as well, after, after Mel's done responding. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, it mostly pertains to my calling, because that's just, I think that's like a really big focus for me is optimizing and making sure my calling is on point. I'm not like making the wrong decisions. I'm not like missing any details and stuff like that. And um, kind of in tandem with what Moon was talking about with Lexi, is uh, our calling on Bind has seen significant improvement. And not just working with yeah, me, but also yeah. working with Alexis. But for me, I would put on this doc. There's a bunch of, there's like a bunch of categories for like type of goals, and then there's like questions at the end, like Moon said of like, okay, like breaking down. Did I make my goal today? Like, do I need help? Like, what do I need to improve on? Yada yada yada. And I put binds on there. And then after that, we had like a one-on-one -on -one session where it's just like me and a coach, and we're just sitting like in a Discord call for an hour, screen sharing watching back either like a pro VOD and our VOD, comparing the VODs. Um, it's, pre it's pretty in-depth process. And then on that end, um, while Moon is working with me, the coaches are communicating with each other. And obviously they are the only ones that have access to all the documents. And now they go to Lexi, who is kind of like the secondary ideal for the team. And they work with her at the same time. And so it all is like really cohesive and it just comes together. And yeah, I think the biggest example of that would be yeah. definitely our calling on binds. I think it has really brought out the most in people and especially uh, myself. Awesome. Oh, well, you can't. Um, I've definitely worked on a lot of like different like micro things, but I think one of the biggest things that like stood out to me recently was like just talking about like angles and off angles in general, because like, you know, in the game and in around like, you know, like standing here feels good and standing here feels bad, like peaking this feels good, peaking this feels wrong, but like really going into like why like that happens and like how to like apply like different like I don't know different things from one spot on the map to another and like abusing like what the other person is clearing when like has just really helped me a lot in my gameplay and in my mechanics in general that's something that I've really like really felt the impact of um, yeah. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, that's also, it's, it's something as simple as angles is like so huge. It's like a different, different way of looking at a map. It's like one of those things for new players, especially like new players who don't understand like the distance dynamic in, in terms of like angles that if you're close to the angle of engagement versus far away, the close person can't see the other person, whereas the other person can see like half the body of that person. Like, like navigating a map in, in that way. It's like, that, that's something that a lot of people don't even realize that, that like how important those kinds of things are. So it's, it's awesome to see how deep that, that skill set actually goes if you really focus on it. And in terms of like picking up all the details and, and, and all of the work that goes into kind of an analysis, I can really see that in the way that, that Cloud9 White approaches the game, right? Because of all the teams that I've watched uh, in, in Game Changers and, and even you know, looking at you know, just the average kind of pro teams in the North American scene in general, um, I, I really can see the methodical play style in, in action with with how you're you're setting it up because you what you, uh, you guys tend to do a lot, which I've noticed is of course you're like a very default heavy team. And you you tend to like start with a slow pace, which is great because you're you're controlling and making. It, I mean, this is how it comes across to me is that you're controlling the situation in the in the in the most ways possible, so that you can through watching VODs and stuff, like you know what all the reactions should be because everything's a lot more controlled as opposed to being more explosive. And you do you do a lot of mid-round stalls as well to like bait certain responses, which I can pre I presume with all the VOD reviewing that you're doing, when you see certain responses with certain utility, I can now, I can like, wow, that probably tells you so much more than we can probably guess, uh, even if we have all the information as as kind of the viewers. So I'm, I'm seeing all of the pieces coming together and how methodical you guys are. And with that said, um, I want to dive more into this, but let's uh, let's take a quick break and let's look at some bots. Uh, we have uh, we have the uh, VOD review tool powered by Microsoft uh, to check out uh, you know some of these rounds from the recent Game Changers tournament where you're playing Exet uh, female, and I have a, a few rounds here that I want to you know take you through. And the first one is going to be the pistol round, and there's a few reasons why I've selected this. And you know, it's, firstly, it's because the piss around is ever important. And the other reason is because I've noticed that, you know, you tend to, you know, albeit I think the grand finals of Game Changers this time around, I think you guys won like what, five, uh, you lost, sorry, five of like seven pistols or something. I don't know, like you lost most of the pistols, but <laughs> generally I feel like you have really good pistols. Um, so I want to check out the the opening pistol from Haven here against Exet Female. Um, so can you firstly, um, Moonchopper, can you run me through what you think a good makes a good pistol before we go into this? Because I know you know you guys have a lot of detail to these rounds. Um, I think the biggest thing about a pistol is you have very finite utility. So whatever space you're taking, you definitely need to hold that space. Otherwise, if you're just taking that space to remove yourself from it for later, then you're not accomplishing much unless it's for a fake, right? Um, the biggest thing that in this pistol for us was, I mean, this is just a really classic pistol from us. We, going into this tournament, we wanted to make sure that a lot of our pistols weren't like, oh, we're going to pull out the pistol we want to pull, pull out on Grand Finals. So we pulled out a pistol that's like six months old, basically, <laughs> here. <laughs> um, so, yeah. yeah. And it's really cool if we, if we go back again to the beginning here. Um, Obviously, this is like a classic sort of just fake situation where it's like a lot of presence. And one of the things I think that's amazing about Valorant, obviously, is that opponents can read into all sorts of things because every, every player is playing a different agent. So that could mean different things based on the strengths of those agents and where you'd want to use them or where you would expect to use them. So here, you know, you've got, um, I believe, the uh, Jet and Astra kind of play, basically that will play into the C site. And you're kind of running the fake with the Cypher, the Sova, um, as well as fit the Phoenix. So any any comments? I know I'm kind of breaking down a pistol here for everybody's benefit, but um, and maybe not yours, but um, any reasons why you're you're using this particular distribution of agents for these roles? Because I would assume you're, what you're trying to do is like really suggest you're going to A. So is that the reason why we're we're looking at these these agents? I mean, so the biggest thing is like um, you don't necessarily need jet to spearhead a control here what's better to make more like threat presence is just a flash here and obviously silva dart is like the most standard like presence showing right um having your astra in a lobby doesn't make sense because what it does is just it gives a potential for if people are running an aggro lobby strat then your astra who needs to smoke off and delay the po uh, delay the plant right just gets killed and there's no point in having astra there like why would you have astra there right so those are the main things. I know if we didn't have Phoenix, we would have Sky, and it would be the same situation where you just slot in Sky for Phoenix here. 
Um, but yeah, that's majorly the reason why we have this kind of uh, agent spread. And of course, like Cypher is just has the cage cross and then just has the info for short. And if they give up a lobby control and if C goes wrong, then we can just go back because we have short control, right? Um, the biggest thing here is also since we're playing against a Cypher, we aren't afraid of like popping into a Cypher because unlike like Killjoy, if it was Killjoy, then her Molly stall is way more, I don't know, it's way stronger than Cypher stall. We can just walk up, contact, break trips, and just go in. We can just double push the cages and we'll be fine versus like there's a Molly separating us and we can't do anything and their fast rotates are already here, so... Yeah, I, I feel like this was this was really cool as well because there's another detail that I noticed. I mean, every there's every detail is important. Oops, I actually minimized it there, but every detail is important. Um, for example, as well, I noticed that you actually decide, you know, you drop the cage. Obviously, that's going to be something that's in your default as well. But you actually challenge through the cage, which kind of confirms the pressure, basically. Yeah. Because if they didn't play anyone in sewers, then they still they're not going to re necessarily react with what you want, which is the rotation. So. I feel like it looks like a really simple pistol, but like there's everything is in play in its place. Is there any comments, um, Mel and, and Kat, like that you have on on this kind of pistol or pistols in general for your team? Sorry, I'm here in the wrong place. I would say um, specifically for this pistol in this specific matchup, it's interesting because it ended up being actually a three four at a. They their pistol was a super aggressive defense pistol to fight for lobby control, and they would just. Like they would win or lose the round right here, pretty much. Well, and committing with four right. usually means right. they would win out and yeah. makes the retake over at C or B um, a lot easier for them. But I would say we definitely went out in this engagement because we went even in a three four situation, essentially. Um, and with the utility they were using, I think in an ideal world, they should be able to to wipe us. But uh, we ended up getting the trades and went out in the situation anyway. So I think we played this pretty well. <laughs> we definitely went out. The odds were stacked against us for sure. Uh, it definitely worked out nicely. Um, speaking of which, we're going to go to a round that didn't work out quite so nicely. It's going to be round five. Yes, yeah, so I'll cue this one up. So one of the reasons why I picked this round is this is kind of a classic situation where it's an anti-eco situation. So you're playing against the eco, and I know in Counter-Strike, this was one of the, the the difficult things for a lot of teams because you have to you have to not over respect the other team or kind of burn too much of the clock and you have to kind of play your advantages without again giving too much respect and and it, it there can be a lot of problems even though like on the face of it you have so many advantages it some, sometimes seems very hard to win these so um i'll let this round you know play out whilst we we talk about this one but yeah what's the general philosophy um moon chopper when you're going into anti-ecos and like protocols that you have i presume this is something that you think about a lot mm -hmm. I think it depends on map to map about like where you want to place because I mean the most default response is going to be just play it like just play in spawn hold every lane with each other if you're the solo and you're getting pushed by multi fall off give off the angle everyone else like take space in your own lanes right um generally speaking that's like most how anticos are played is like people just hold for pushes right um in I don't know for this round i need to keep watching because I, I actually don't remember what happens in this round um but yeah so we just take a control here and then we're putting presence like denying info for the walking garage but we haven't broken the trip so it's whatever we threat mid oh i remember this now <laughs> we threaten the b plant so the breach is here from link we have two people hold here, and then we have Jazzy walking in. Just doesn't clear the corner right there. Oh, yeah, I remember this round. We just don't we just don't clear the, the easy angles. Yeah, we're not playing like buddy system whatsoever. We're just going solo. Like a big advantage when you like a philosophy you want to have when you're playing against anti-eco is like leveraging how much utility you have. Like you shouldn't be um generally speaking, you should not be contacting into sites. You should be able to leverage the fact that you have way more money than them, therefore you have better guns and you have better utility. And you can use that to clear every angle and um, make your entry into site way easier and generally have like a buddy system. And that's something that we definitely failed to do this round. We kind of just like walked into them. Yeah, we're one to one. And we play the macro. Off. Yeah. The macro is good here. We we kept like there's no st we fleshed out that there wasn't like a, a four man stack. We had control. We ended at the site that we had control at. And then we faked B with drone to keep like a, I think we baited off one of the rotators at A, which I feel like is a mistake from Exa. You generally just want to keep a gamble. You don't want to play rotates when you're on eco. Um, I 
gave them a gun. That's a mistake by me. I tried to lurk into B and go for C link, and I whiffed. But yeah, I think I think it comes down to like not really leveraging our utility here and just going in by ourselves. Yeah, like our spacing is really bad, and we can just double up uh, long here. We already have long control. We just check close right, and that's it. We just have three people there, and we're chilling. Like us going one to one with short and long, and also like e even that is like fine to an extent. It's just the fact that people are the timing is really bad because like Jazzy just walks in. We don't have to walk in. We just play our range and play our util. We can trade one to one with their utility because theirs is finite. They might not even have utility. The biggest thing that they have is just breaches like stun coming back on CD. That's it. And like after the first wave of utility, we just launch ours again and they have nothing for it because we can slow down the round and just do that every time. It's awesome. I mean, there's, there's so much to talk about here because like, uh, again, like, as you say, like this, so, so like, I suppose, like, you know, looking back at this, you're thinking about spacing. Um, it sounds like that's a large part of the the issue here. Um, but I liked, you know, I liked a lot of the the approach, like, you know, this, the amount, because one thing I've noticed from, from Cloud9 White as a team in general is that there's like this philosophy of always trying to create scenarios which are very uncertain for your opponents, which is, that's like what you're supposed to do. That's like such a good thing, because then you force a reaction. They have to question something. So the, the wall, the firewall that we see here from long into the site, um, obviously you can't know that there's like a sky sitting in the corner here, like Ellie sitting in this corner. Um, but it seems to me like this was intended to create pressure and, and bait utility and be somewhat of a fake. Obviously Ellie being in that position, it knows, you know, has has tabs on that. So that's not going to happen. But is, is that the point of the kind of dropping the firewall in here is to kind of confuse, like start moving their defense around a lot? It's to threaten. It's to threaten the like that we're taking one lane, right? Like if Ellie wasn't here, then they would have to like peek through like from backside. Which I mean, if there wasn't a smoke, we can see that. It's similar to how on ascent you would do the same thing towards A site, where you would flame wall and cut LOS of a uh, tree, right? So that way everyone on site is like isolated and heaven needs to peek or site needs to peek. It's just to like make sure that when we do this flame wall, they have to get information. Otherwise, they're feeling uncertain, right? And so, yeah. yeah. And I guess, like you said, the their utility is finite. So if you can kind of drain that more, then this, that sounds like a good plan. Um, with that said, uh, let's check out the next round I've got up here, which is going to be round number six, actually, the very next round. And I wanted to just look at this round because it's just an example of something that, you know, is, is very common for you, which is just the defaults, basically. And and um, getting a little bit of buffer, buffer here, but here we go. Um, oh, am I actually in round six? Okay, oh, that was a replay. Gotcha. Okay, so round six, um, a bit of C long pressure, you know, falls into a default, and exit females kind of already set up looking to maybe be aggressive or react quickly around garage. Um, but uh, Kak, do you, I don't know if you remember this round, but are you able to speak to to this round at all if you remember it? Um, I'd have to watch the round. So. <laughs> oh yeah, no worries. So. Yeah, after that initial pressure on C long, it's it's the case that because I you know I think you you dropped the cage already towards you know a lobby, so it's like a very normal stuff. And it seems to me that Exit Female are actually kind of gambling. They they had the gamble stack here. They've not got any information going into the mid rounds. I don't see them actually confirming what in mid round info with any util. So and then you and on your side of things, it's been completely dead silent until the re pop of the or the pop of this cage here on a a lobby. And in terms of like the rotations, you're walking into a site with one player. So this is like obviously a great, you know, great um, result in terms of like in this position, this snapshot. I mean, what's about to happen is a bit tragic, but <laughs> but uh, otherwise, this is ideal, right? You have one player isolated on the site, and Mariner plays really well with the with the cages to isolate the fights, but and wins a bunch of jewels. But in terms of like the whole process of this rounds and the philosophy behind the the default. Um, what are the what are the thoughts behind this approach in terms of the pros, the cons, the reasons that you're doing this? Um, obviously, the round doesn't end out how you want necessarily, but but uh, but I think um, nine times out of ten you win win this round. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mostly our goal with a lot of these defaults, especially on Haven, is like there's like one area of the map that we're aiming to like take and take control. And like with C, usually it's mostly because we want an orb because like taking C long isn't like the most like important spot on the map necessarily. Um, but yeah, like our goal, like we leave Jazzy in C long or we'll leave somebody in C long. Sometimes it's me um, and then like take that orb and then also just like 
get info and get um like utility out from them because like we can see like who's on C based off of like what reaction they give um and like who they're playing on a site like if they have like you know two stack towards C and like one garage and like we don't see cipher anywhere like that usually means that the cipher is playing retake on the other side of the map right so and then if we can take that site and then we have somebody lurked out somewhere else like it's usually a pretty good site hit from there um yeah I think I end up getting spammed through the smoke at a long and then cypher gets a lot of kills there <laughs> yeah 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 it's, this is like defaulting in general seems to be like a, a big focus um for for cloud nine white and having a slower pacing um what is um you know going back to you moon you know with this approach is this because you feel like this is the optimal way to play the game or is it you know what is what is the reason for this uh in, in your eyes at least your reasonings so i think against like I don't know. I, I think it bases it's based off of who you're playing to, because if you're playing against a team that's like aggressive and has like you know quote unquote an ego or whatever, not even ego, just confidence, just like really good aim, like they will re aggro, like they will they will get info and re aggro, and a lot of these teams during this tournament don't do that. They are like afraid and they stay in their lane. Like if you can imagine like a line of demarcation or whatever, like they don't go past the line in from like garage <laughs> win, like middle, like they don't they just don't and so like here you threaten long c with the sova ulti with the drone no one's going to peek and break the drone on a sova ulti on a c that's like the most like normal normal exec ever right and so you threaten that you realize okay cypher is not playing c so let's see if he's a oh there's a trip there's a trip a we just misplayed and got hit by the trip and we, they got a lucky spam through the smoke right and that's it like there wasn't really much to say. Our macro was pretty good here. We threatened. They stayed. They didn't do anything. They just dogged out Jazzy. Jazzy showed presence, and Jazzy got seen by the Astra, right? The classic Jet Lurk. And then the Breach stayed because of that. And then we just hit sight, and we just lost because of a spam. And uh, Lexi's pathing was to the far left and could have been, like, cut into the site and because we can just smoke off CT. We don't have to be afraid of, like, people fast retaking through CT when there's a Cypher playing on site. That's kind of grief, right? It's like, why are, why are you fast retaking when I'm playing retake, you know? So a little bit of optimization and pathing there, but otherwise, like, this is just, like, a whatever round. Like, we just go next, like, so. Yeah. And well, to add the oh, two details here, um, for my POV, when calling this as well, you notice that if you go to the beginning, you notice that um, Arsova, I think Chubbo was playing for us in this match. She has ulti, and that plays a really big part in threatening a potential C pop here. Um, from Xset's POV, if they're keeping track of ults, then they know their Sova has ult. Okay, wait, Sova's joining up long. And I feel like they could have had maybe a faster reaction, or maybe we could have um, maybe put a star down because from their POV, like they, they could have easily Everyone been hit on at this moment. Through. And it doesn't really seem like they're extremely ready for us to just take the site, to be honest. But typically what would happen is like, oh shit, like Sova has drone, Sova has all Sova drone coming up C, like you're very worried about the C hit here. And another big thing is the fact that we have Jazzy up into this position to listen. And what ends up happening is she starts communicating to us because right here they start doing a info play, which is where they need to clear out lobby or uh, clear out the cubby. And Jazzy's feeding us all this info that they're like trying to clear because she gets she ends up getting recharged. And we saw Astra on drone earlier, so we know there's two C. And we have a good... um. We have a good guess that they're not pushed down mid, and so we know there's generally like three C. We can gamble that they're generally three C where um where Jazzy is based off of the info that we got and her getting cleared out here. And so, like uh like mentioned already before, that that can give us to a pretty reasonable um guess that they're playing retake over at A. And keeping Jazzy here always threatens us to be able to come back in case they do somehow like push mid or over rotate to A. We always have that other option to come back C, which is really important. But yeah, just this, uh, I said like multiple things, but um, really it, you get a lot of value off of like droning C early if you can threaten an ult yeah, play so and getting someone into that cubby to listen and see if they be clear is really important to see what info they give you. Yeah, I love all of that. I actually missed a trailblazer too. That's a, yeah, that's, man, in, in looking at the rounds, you know, it's, it feels like, as you say, X are playing like pretty scared, generally speaking here, like very passive, very kind of gambly in, in that sense. like. And just that that one piece of you told the trailblazer seems like the only info they're able to kind of look for. And that's obviously like definitely not enough. And so, yeah, I feel like you win this round nine times out of 10. You know, thank you for kind of going through the explanations there. You know, I, you know, you know me, I could do this. I could do this literally all day. But um, I think it's, it's time to, uh, you know, move on to on to the next uh, topics um, here. And I think, you know, 
I'm, I'm probably going, we're going to come back to the coaching thing here because we want, I want to take us through some topical news items, um, you know, things that have been going on in the Valorant community and to get some of your thoughts on some of these things. And I think the, the first place to start is, I think, maybe the most shocking thing in the scene for most people, which is the fact that, you know, despite doing so well, um, Under Thieves have taken out what seems to be a pillar of the team, the in-game leader. You know, Steel is gone from the team, in a, you know, for whatever reason, um, that's that's the case. And, I mean, what would happen if, if Mel left the team? You know, in, in like, how disruptive is this going to be for 100 Thieves that's about to play the last chance qualifiers and now they've got to, you know, regardless of, of you know, however good the, the person replacing Steel is, you know, that surely is going to be... Is, is there a world where this isn't a, cat a catastrophe? I mean, I definitely don't think it's a decision that 100 Thieves just, like, made on the fly. Like, they obviously had a lot of, like, forethought going into this. And, like, you know, I've heard a bunch of rumors about why or when or why all this happened. But um, honestly, at the end of the day, it's just... Uh, I don't even know. Like, we'll just see what happens, honestly. Um. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't see this come out and just be like a staff decision. Just be like, we don't like you, you're cut without like obviously talking yeah. to the players. It, everyone has a voice in that regard. So I think this was a long time coming um, and they knew about it. So I don't think it's going to impact them that much. And I feel like they probably had um, ideas of who they were playing with already prior. Um and probably even practiced with them earlier um, to just to see what they're like and see if they have a good fit. And honestly, like that's the only thing you need is just if it if their fifth feels good, that's it. So, I think the shocking thing to me was um, I, I obviously I don't think any of us know what the internal um, situation is at 100 Thieves, but um, it, it is definitely so shocking seeing them like do pretty well at the international uh, international stage and then right before LCQ he's he's gone like it it makes you think like so, does something goes so wrong that they couldn't even stick it out for like another three weeks you know it's just like i it, you can't help but be curious like what went wrong at the yeah, 100 thieves camp like what's going through their heads right now so i think that's i i have no idea i i no clue <laughs> it's just very interesting yeah it's it's kind of crazy um I'm, of course you know wish them the the best but um i'm a big steel fan so sad to sad to not see him there uh, but I mean, it's Steel. If there's one thing we know about Steel, is he is not going anywhere. Because I mean, if he was able to stick it out in the Counter Strike for so long after the ban, and was still very competitive, still had that much passion and fire to play, you know, I feel like he's going to be back with a vengeance. So, looking forward to seeing the return of Steel in whatever fashion that takes place. Um, but for the next item, you know, we have um, uh, Mike's uh, HD leaving Envy. So, for those who aren't aware, he was the coach for Envy, he did a trial period with them for about a month. And then uh, a couple months later, they decided to uh, engage in conversations to sign him. And they were, you know, under contract negotiation processes to sign him as a coach with all full intentions to sign him as a coach. Then, of course, we find out recently that that never actually happened. He never got signed despite uh, being the coach throughout like a three, three to four month period, um, helping Envy, you know, basically get the best results they've ever had. They did have, you know, yay and Marv come in. But it's normally quite difficult to just slot. It doesn't matter how good they are, but just slotting new players in. Typically, there'll be a honeymoon period, but actually integrating them. Um, it seems like it went very well for Envy, and they got second, obviously, at the biggest tournament we've had this year. Then we find out that now Mike's is leaving because he's having so many issues in the org, actually, um, you know, getting them, getting their shit together, basically, and, and signing him. Um, so he didn't want to continue with that. So... That's now well, that leads to the question: What's going to happen with Envy? They had this coach that was clearly working for them, um, had a process with them, and now they're without that coach. What's the impact there? Do you think, like, um, you know, from from your perspective, uh, Moon, what, like, what do you make of a situation like this? It's hard to say because there have been many issues with Envy in the past. They're known to be really good and have good placings, but then choke last second all the time. And it comes to a point whether it's like, is that a staff problem? Is that a player? problem or is that a team problem for me it felt like it was like a morale team problem they needed someone and there were tweets from i can't remember maybe fns was tweeting like ever since Ye was on the team he's like their hype man he's like bringing them back up their morale is high and that's like a huge telling for me that that team again that chokes a lot has or a history of choking needed someone to like give them hype and give them get them back up and have their morale up the whole time and whether or not like why coaching staff cannot do that and integrate that well with their previous members is a question that i, I can't ever answer right but um 
with mics, I'm unsure like how much of that in, like involves with the team. Like, what does he do with the team? Like, is that the biggest and only factor about Envy that was holding them back? That's like the biggest question for me is what else held Envy back the whole time besides the most obvious thing? So, yeah, and I think one extra thing there as well is I, and this is why I love that you know you're on the show with us today because again, you know. It's, it's hard to know what's going on in the in the in for each team with regards to like what what are the coaches doing you know it's a, it's, su it's such a broad role and it can be a lot of different things and it might not be the things the team needs or maybe it is um but obviously i think you know you coming on the show um what i'm learning about you is that you're very articulate in in terms of how you understand and you know talk about the game which which only is only a very very good thing and because you're dealing with players on a consistent basis and managing you know players and and sort of and the kind of social interactions and stuff like you're talking about the morale seems like a really difficult aspect of it as well um you know for for you and your experience like what has been like the most um unnatural um part of of the coaching role for you or something that you've learned to do or something that you're working on um in coaching that didn't come naturally to you the biggest thing is like having dream around as a head coach he has a lot of experiences especially like coaching in owl I learned a lot. He is very articulate with his, with his words. He's very good at managing his words in a way that helps the players. I'm really bad. I'm like super straightforward, pretty blunt with things. Um, and he just makes things sound very smooth and just very like he's been practicing them for years and it just comes out like that. Um, that's something I strive to do and it's something I wish I can do and I'm working on as well. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the beginning of the question. <laughs> yeah, essentially, um, in terms of the dev you developing yourself in your own role, um, obviously, analytically, it's like you seem like that's like a really kind of natural strength of yours. Are there other elements that you have had to, you feel like, oh, I could do a better job in this area um, as, as being a coach? And, you know, what, what are some of the weaknesses or things you've been working on for yourself to become a better coach? I think on the fly, in the moment, saying the right thing at the right time. I think Dream is really good at that. I do not have enough experience for that even though on past teams for me i've been an igo when i was playing professionally and honestly like uh before cloud nine morning light and all the teams before then in valorant during beta was my first like coaching like experience so going into this it's definitely like a player being a coach rather than like a coach who's been a coach the whole time coaching it's i've so I think the biggest part for it for me is that since I've been in IGL most of like most of my life and I have like a loud voice, that's where a lot of it comes from. But again, like in the moment, being able to like sympathize and say the right things without sounding like, you know, you're angry at your players or you want to like you don't want to sound mean, you want to uplift them. And that's like the thing that I see Dream doing very easily. And it does not come as easy to me. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Every, everyone's different in how they want to like receive criticism or, or and so on. That's that's definitely a tough part. Um, but uh, uh, going on to the next thing, I wanted to get some thoughts here on on Fracture. Obviously, this will eventually come into the map pool. It's it's the seventh map, so we actually get a seven map pool because of this, and it's very different. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with it in just just matchmaking, just messing around. But in terms of the actual application of this into the into the professional circuit when you have actual teams creating strategies and tactics and defaults and all the all the rest of it um you know i, I want to get your thoughts first katsumi how what are your thoughts on on fracture have you managed to play it a lot what do you how do you feel about it um we have not i've not gotten to play it a lot we were focusing on game changers and fracture was not on the map pool for game changers and we just came out of that so i haven't really looked into it that much i've been just really focused on that event but in the few like games that i have managed to like queue into and ranked and stuff i do think that it's going to be like a very different experience from like the typical maps like even just like the agent comps that i'm seeing like on a day-to-day -day is like very like atypical from you know like the standard like haven bind kind of comps um and i'm really excited to see how like that changes the gameplay um how about you mel are you uh you've been grinding any fracture um i was invited to play some like you know when it got released for the bct participants or whatever there was some like pro 10 mans uh being played with like bbg eg uh, members from Immortals were playing in it. Exa, I think, were playing in it at some point. And um, we were, I mean, this is literally day one. So I have no idea if these things are, you know, relevant now that Fracture's been out so long and teams have been scrimming it. But um, it definitely was a fun map. And I can't say that maps in the, pre in, the in the past that have been released were fun. 
off the gauntlet. I, I would say when I played Icewalk for the first time, first couple of times, I did not think that map was fun whatsoever. It literally has just go away, go away. Like even it was a meme, right? Immortals went a 12 times in a row on attack. It was not a fun map whatsoever, at least for me. But playing Fracture and also playing at like a high level or trying to, it was still a really, really fun map. And I feel like there's a lot of creativity that can flourish on that map. And I think it is a map that kind of embodies Valorant pretty well. Um, I'm really interested to see what other ideals come up with, but uh, we tested so many different comps and it, it just seems like there's a lot of room for freedom. I feel like on that map, you can have up to like two, even three slots of agents that you want to play. But on some maps, like a lot of the maps right now, it's pretty standard that you have like four and then like one that you could flex. So you need like, you need these four agents to like have like a really good, um, really good attack defense. But on that map, it's like, I would say you need Astra and KJ. And that's even my opinion. Some people will go completely different than me. And the, having that flexibility for those last three is just really interesting and fun. Yeah, I can't wait to see what people come up with. Uh, Imun, have you, are you kind of consistent on the thoughts there with Mel? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is I'm so tired of seeing like double info or characters that have pseudo roles. And by that, I mean pseudo roles. I mean like they have flashes that give info that they play like two different roles. KO does that to an extent, but not as great as like Sky. Sky just is like the biggest bang for your buck character. And when you're playing against Sky Sova, you're always thinking like, okay, well, they can pop with Sky stuff. They can also pop with Sova stuff. So which one are they doing and are they faking with it? And it's really hard to do anything off of that. On Fracture, it feels like double info is not as strong and it feels like more, again, like what Mel is saying, like you have multiple free slots to play any kind of duelist and pop off with those duelists. And yeah, that's like the biggest thing I I cannot wait for is just, I'm so tired of characters getting too much value and just making the game feel way more slower than it already is. I yeah, would love um, to see okay. more Soba free maps. Oh, I was just saying I'd love to see more Soba free maps, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're totally fine. Just uh, hating on Soba, that's fine, that's fine. I'm, I'm with you. Um, in, uh, in a brief moment, we'll, I mean, first of all, we'll go for a, a quick, uh, you know, predictions on LCQ and there's another question on the meta I have, but we'll be moving, uh, as we do every single time in the nights, uh, moving into Twitch questions as we, you know, go into the last 10 minutes. So you can already start, you know, sharing with us some of those Twitch questions. You know, feel free in the chat to, direct those questions to any one individual or to everybody just you know it's up to you um uh, but yeah start populating the chat with those questions we'll get to those in a moment but first things first um i want to also get a kind of temperature check on on the jet rebalance obviously jet's been a big talking point in terms of how broken jet is and uh the dash is is one of the i mean the main thing i think for people um as well as the the blade storm and the blade storm has been nerfed at least like the right clicks now if you do, if you do a right click you get a kill with it it's it doesn't refresh, but it does refresh the knives if you get the the single click kills. So it's supposed to kind of I guess raise the skill ceiling a little bit to that alt and make it less kind of easy to play with. Um, how do we feel about this? Is this enough? Is Jet still too too mad? I personally think the changes were great, but not enough. Um, but I do really like the changes that they did make. Um, like especially like like I see like you know like some like Reddit analysis of like people who just play ranked all day. Like they're like I don't know why you would take away like one of the smokes, but I personally think at like a high level, just having like a one way on the fly, like three of those like all the time is just like so oppressive. Like playing against like like Shazam does it really well. I play against him in ranked a lot, and like those constant one ways were just so frustrating in the middle of like a ranked game. Um, um, and yeah, I think the knives, of course, like the abusing the right click, taking that away is nice. But I would like to see something with the dash because that is a very, like, oppressive ability. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Yeah, I, I agree too that um, like obviously her dash is like the best part of her kit. But what was something that a lot of people weren't talking about were her smokes and just how disruptive they are. And the thing about her smoke is they are very versatile. They can be used for like anything, dude. You can one way, you can smoke yourself, you can get inside the smoke, you can use it for retakes like caterpillar smokes, you can get into a site. It's actually mind blowing how versatile her smokes are. And that makes her such a good duelist is that there's just so much you can do around it. And especially really good jet players are very good at mobilizing Three, around the smokes, not just two, for one ways, but one. for like cutting off this angle and having the awareness to like cut off the second contact and fight the first contact. Like people are insane with their smokes. And I'm really glad that it's down to two, honestly. I thought that was something that was not really mentioned when people were talking about nerfing jet. And so I'm glad they picked up on that. Yeah, but uh, I, yeah, I'm really I happy they nerfed her right click too. That was absolutely absurd that it was inside the game for that long. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think everyone who played Jet before the nerf was like feeling their smokes were infinite. But now since the nerf, like they really feel it's finite. They really feel like each smoke has to have a purpose. And I feel like Valorant has been doing that for every agent. For with like Sky, for example, you felt like your flashes were infinite as well. Like, but now that you have a CD on it, it feels like oh, every single one has to have a purpose. And if I don't get value out of it, then it's just wasteful and I'm not gonna get it back. And especially so with Jet. So yeah it yeah she's crazy i, th I think of the, the 10 things you mentioned as well mel she you didn't i don't think you mentioned like the the smoke dash as well like as an entry to sites and stuff like yeah it's it is actually kind of nuts if you put it all in one place just like how many things she can do um but with that said um we will be moving into the the q a uh, in just a second but first i want to get predictions for lcq from all of you um of course you're not allowed to pick cloud nine because we know that that would be the answer for everybody so if it's not Cloud9 Blue that wins LCQ and qualifies for champions, who is who's the second best? Well, I'm uh, rooting for hard. 100 Thieves, so <laughs> I hope it works out for them, whatever changes they have. Let me pull up who's in LCQ. I think there's a team that I'm getting about right now. Hold on. All right, let's see, was... version one, phase, exit, LG, C9 Blue, Gen G, Rise, 100 Thieves. If not 100 Thieves, I, I honestly want to see exit, wouldn't it? Yeah, I like yeah, Part of me does. Yeah, my first choice would be 100 Thieves just because going into this roster change, I'm like, I just want to see how they perform in every single game. I want them to keep moving on and to see what their new player brings in and just how does the team cohesion change? Does their play style change? I doubt it'll change to an extent, but like, I just want to see what this new blood brings. But I feel like Exit has just been always crossing the fence of like, oh, we're going to make it to the point where it's just like, it's going to happen at one point. I want it to happen at one point. It's just, how long are you guys going to make me wait? So. <laughs> yeah, it's like the toughest tour. To, like, it's so cutthroat. Only one, you get like nothing basically unless you win. So it's insane. Um, but with that said, we'll move on to some of the questions in chat that... Uh, all of you lovely people in the chat have been so wonderful as to provide. And the first question is coming from Joanna. I don't know if it's Joanna or Joanna, but I'll go with Joanna0101. Uh, if you could choose to play any agent for the team aside from your standard roles, which would you choose? And I want to start with, with Katsumi here. Oh, okay. Probably, actually, now that KO is like pretty good, I would like to play KO. Um, I've been playing that ranked a little bit, but like that, like secondary duelist, like initiator role, probably is a lot of fun. Oh yeah, what about you, Mel? You want to play okay, KO in as a, well? In a perfectly hypothetical world where I don't get nervous and I'm not afraid to be like a star player, like you know what I mean? Like I think there's like. Some people want to play Jet, but can you really play Jet against Ye? You know what I mean? It's like a mental, like, who is the who's the better player? Like, imagine playing, you're a Jetman, and you're playing against Ye, bro. Like, I would have a mental <laughs> breakdown. But in a hypothetical world where I'm not that person, I feel like being a Jet player is so fucking, oh, it's so fun in this game. It's so fun. <laughs> Come on, you're, like, playing a completely different game, dude. You get to fly around, dash in, do some crazy stuff that no one else in the game can do. If I could, I would be a Jetman and just shorty everybody. It would be so fun. Yeah, the movement. I, I hope that the next agent that we get is like another movement based agent because I think that's super fun. And yeah, you're playing like a different game when you're playing jazz, like actually just out there all by herself. Our um, next question is by John Pye. Thoughts on Breeze? Now it's been out for a bit. And uh, again, I'll start with you, Kaz. Um, I, I feel like I have like a love hate relationship with Breeze. I don't know. Like some days it's a lot of fun, some days I just hate it. Like I guess it just depends on how, like, because like, how hard the enemy team is abusing like the big like like the lurking and the jet op are the two like really frustrating things to play against on that map because they're so good um but yeah i don't know i guess some days i love it some days i just want to dodge it every every time i get it in queue so oh same literally same on everything <laughs> what do you mean i hate the map I, I absolutely hate the map. I only see two comps on that map 
everyone is playing it's 80 percent double info the other 20 percent is just double duelist and it's everything else is the same agents and it's just everyone plays it so similarly so i hate it it's just who has better mech that day let's like that's how it feels to me it's who's hitting their shots that day and it just does not feel good i want to watch more breeze but i feel like i'm watching the same game i remove the people's <laughs> names i am watching the same game every time and i'm just so sick of it something needs to change someone needs to implement something new or bring in something new like i know gen g was doing brimstone and they were doing some mickey mouse looking smokes and that was cool but like i mean that's it i haven't seen anything else new like sure i see like the kj from g2 but that's it like i i want to see something new yeah, I um, I'm with you on that one. I do wonder actually, with regards to right games and the, how they look at this stuff, if they're going to think about the approach of we're going to just keep adding maps, or if it's going to be that they'll just start tweaking maps that they have um at a certain point and just like actually ch like fundamental changes, like removing certain like boxes from sites and like you know stuff like that. Um, because people were theorizing about that in CS:GO because because people are so resistant to learning new maps. Or if it's going to be the case that it's just going to be about like the agents, there's going to be so many more agents that that's how the maps are going to change. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. There's a lot of different options, but I hope. That, uh, but I agree. Hope, hopefully something changes. Um, Texarino asks, how often do you change sends? Uh, and that's for Katsumi. Depends. I don't change my sense that much. I I switch between like the same two ones depending on like what I'm working on. Like when I feel like my crosshair placement is bad, I turn it down. Um, but I probably change it like maybe once, maybe once a week at the most, like maybe like a few times in a week if I'm slumping or something, cause just as I need something new, but not a lot. <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, it's nothing too, too wrong with changing sense. I've actually learned a lot about that. It's actually not as bad as you think, but that's another, another topic for another time. Um, another one for you, Katsumi, why are you an Astro one trick from, from Kudin? <laughs> Kudin? Oh that. my goodness. Um, yeah, that was. I actually commented on that because we were actually like what, pulled up the Valorant stream and Sean Garris called me an Astro one trick and then I played <laughs> Viper on the next map. Um, but I am not an Astro one trick. Okay, I play Viper sometimes one one time. Once. It's enough. It's enough. <laughs> and enough for like for the stat on on the LR.gg. So it's all good. Um, <laughs> right. So what about pregame rituals? So this is a, a, a question. And I'll start with email as we just had a, two questions for Cat. Any pregame ritual rituals? I think we. I think I asked this before, and, and I think you and Annie gave me some some uh, something about like meditation or something. I'm not sure if it was real. So you know, I'm, ask, I'm asking that one again. <laughs> it, is, it is. I'm being 100% serious. If I were to go okay. through like my whole pre ritual, I wake up in the morning. I ask Roy for some validation and some reassurance. I'm like, Yo, tell me I'm the best player, real quick, and he. He gives me some validation. Nice way to start off my day. I get some tea and I do be meditating. That's not that's not a cap. That's not that's not a lie. We just meditate. I think I think we literally did that day. I think on Thursday, I think we actually meditated as a group. I don't know if it was Thursday or Tuesday, but we have like a fit gamer thing. But um, but yeah, pretty much uh, I'll do like sun salutations, right? But like two minutes before we start a game, I'll just like do some some sun salutations, some yoga. I, I mean, I'm, I love that. Now, now I know it's not a troll, because because last, last <laughs> I was time, never trolling. last time it was kind of troll. I had that like troll vibe. Like Annie, I wasn't sure. Like, I mean, I mean, but but yeah, that's that's really cool. And it's it's, uh, it's a big deal. Breathing is a big deal when you're playing. Actually, so you don't. I think a lot of players don't realize they actually stop breathing when they're playing. You start focusing so hard, which is actually kind of can be an issue, um, especially if you have a lot of nerves because you you want to keep breathing. Um, but uh, anyway, um, cat pre-match rituals for you um i drink a ton of water i don't know why but on match day especially i'll just like drink a ton of water the second i wake up I, maybe that's just like normal but um i always want to make sure i'm really hydrated but um otherwise i crank my heat up i turn it up really high um because my hands get cold um and i hate playing with cold hands so i just turn my heat all the way up so i I don't know. Usually my heat bill would hurt too much to keep it there. But on match day, I make the exception. Um, um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I Sometimes I do some like breathing or like yoga things if I'm feeling especially nervous. But like most of the time, I just have my water and my sweatshirt on. So. <laughs> nice. I feel like this is like a, a guy-girl thing. Like, for example, like all guys I know just want the room to be cold. And 
all girls that I've spoken to like want the opposite. So like this is a constant fight in my household. But um, but yeah, Moon, do you have any pre-match rituals? Like I mean, because it's I mean, really, you have the most stressful role, which is to actually watch the games as they as they're unfolding. You can't do anything about what's happening. So you know, how, how's that for you? I mean, I guess like yeah, pre-game ritual is just get everyone prepared and everyone hyped up. Make sure like oh, if it's a long day, make sure you have your planned meal, not too big. Make sure you eat it early so it digests early so you don't go into the game digesting and or post digestion and you're feeling sleepy, right? Um it during the game, uh when it's Dream and I watching the tournament, um I'm yelling a lot. Like I'm either hyped, like super hyped or just like, like I I'm super passionate when watching the game. And yeah, that's how I just get all my energy out. Cause then I don't have any of that, like aggression or, you know, <laughs> like when I, ha when there's like attack time, I just need to say what I need to say ASAP. So, but yeah. Yeah. You must've been going nuts over the weekend. Cause that, that finals <laughs> was like really awesome and just very close how was that weekend for you? Um, for me, uh, once we lost a map, it was over. Like it, it was. I already knew it was over. Once we lost Haven and we were going into Bind, Bind's one of our strongest maps because it was like our last map that we worked on going into Game Changers, and I was like super confident, like um because of lexi's good comms on ct side it's been our best map everyone from their perspective is like holy crap this is their best map they they're gonna demolish us they demolished us before like so i knew going into that it's over like we didn't have the pressure of not losing a map ever and that pressure is like huge that needs to be a talking point like especially among like articles or whatever like that's the biggest takeaway that pressure gone it we were back to normal because on Haven, we were making so many micro mistakes. Our macro was good, but once we got into site or we were just doing some silly things you would never see in like even in a scrim, it's just like one offs here and there so many times. And it, at one point when we call attack, I'm, I'm just like, okay, just do the most simplest thing. Like don't overcomplicate things, do the simplest thing. And that's because like there wasn't a like an umbrella saying i could say our umbrella term i could say or focus on for the team that would solve all of our issues because it was just like a different individual every time so yeah i mean well i mean i think that's uh that's a great place i think to leave uh today's show um this is it's been so awesome you know talking to all of you um and you know before we kind of say our goodbyes i want to make sure that everybody knows what you're all up to um and mel let's start with you are you I, I know that you stream quite a lot you know what are you up to in terms of like your streaming and content anything coming up you want to tell people about uh nothing in particular just taking a, a break for the next week gonna decompress because our body goes in like this hyper adrenaline state gotta recover from that so nothing coming up no i feel you i literally slept all day yesterday like the whole day <laughs> like 20 hours or something <laughs> Damn. 20 hours <laughs> what? i'm sorry what? What? like that's a bit extreme Actual hibernation <laughs> wow what about you moon are you sleeping for 20 hours what's going on over there I, I don't know about 20 hours i'd be staying up for like 20 hours so like you'll catch me staying up to like 5 a.m playing games or something i don't know but not nah, just gonna play apex and mel's been getting into it and he's coming back and jazzy's just started it too so we've been playing apex together um for me i think dream and i might uh actually watch the lcq games together and stream that and talk about that because that is something we've been wanting to do for a while but we just don't have the time and energy to do like to watch games back because our practice ends at like 11 all the time and it's just like it's different from like playing ranked like we've been, we just have to like refocus our brain to talk about a match at like 11 p.m. That's like not good content. So, yeah, I, I feel that. But I mean, where can people find? Like, if you are going to be doing that with Dream, where can people find find that? What Twitch channel do they go to, or where do they subscribe? Uh, probably my Twitch channel, since Dream every time he tries to stream, it just does not work. Um, but his is Val RT, and mine is just at Moon Chopper. So probably catch me at catch us at uh, twitch.tv slash moonchopper. Awesome. Well, you know, thank you everybody for taking part in the conversation here today uh, in On The Nines presented by AT&T. Um, that's all from Katsumi, Mel, Moonchopper, and I, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.